All right, so uh, welcome to BSing with Sean K. I'm your host, Sean Neese, and today my guest is uh, April Shaley. She yes. is uh, have, uh, April Ast April's Astrology on YouTube, yes. and she's uh, an astrologer and a musician and composer and a dancer and a dance teacher and uh, a lot of other cool things. So yeah. thanks for coming on. <laughs> Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me to, to join you today. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And uh, I guess just real quickly, tell us about yourself and what it is you do and everything. Well, um, I, I'm a dancer. I'm a, a belly dancer. And that's what I've mostly concentrated on over these last you know several years. Um, but then I had a, a vision, actually, uh, when I did a, a shamanic journey, and I, I had been wanting to sort of switch gears a little bit. So in this vision, I, I asked, you know, what should I do for my income? And uh, the, the, uh, the spirits that attended me put me in a recliner and pulled it backwards so that I'd be looking up at the stars. And they put a, um, a, a bowl in my hands. There's a magnetic bowl. And it was it magnetized coins. And so they said to look up at the stars and speak what you see and spend time with that. So, so I developed April's astrology. I've been an astrologer uh, for a long time, but um, I've, I've been concentrating on things. That, and now I'm trying to concentrate on all my art forms. <laughs> so I don't really rest very much. Uh, I crash is what happens. <laughs> So, so it's like that's some of what you do too, I guess, like with shamanic drumming and uh, have have a pe helping people find things through visions. Is that like? I don't work with clients much that way, although I could. I've I've done some intensives on shamanic belly dance, uh, going back to the some of the roots of belly dance and and how that that converges with shamanism. Um, things like the Guedra or the Czar. You know, they they have shamanic roots um, and I have people journey do moving meditations where they're belly dancing into these journeys. So we, I do some things like that sometimes. But with my astrology clients, I mostly have them work with their emotional bodies and I'm also using uh, Byron Katie's work. And I ask them, is it true? You know, when they make a statement that's that rings to me like a, a belief that may not have, you know, a basis in reality. You know, I ask, is it is, is that sit with that feeling? Is is that true? You know, we see where that goes. And like, how did uh, so like, how did like uh, your spiritual beliefs or like your interest in uh, this kind of like uh, I guess mystical kind of thing? How how did that develop? Well, I think I was born with it. So, and I I feel pretty strongly about that, considering that I was born into a very uh, sort of literal. Uh, concrete thinking Republican family, or at least that's what they were emphasizing. I think that they've been, been may have been suppressing, you know, big parts of who they are um, to, 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 to create me. That must have been so. Um, but I, you know, have always been interested in in the mystical, and I didn't know what that was when I was a child. So I was just strange. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't quite connect with a lot of the other kids. It's taken me a long time, you know, to find my kin. I didn't really get to do that until, uh, you know, college, really. But you were raised like a uh, Christian, and then like you're or... sort of, yeah, by default. My family is Catholic, um, and uh, though I was baptized, strangely, I was baptized Protestant. My mother had a, an idea that somehow that that was, would be more feminist. I'm not quite sure how that was supposed to work out since they cut out Mary, but um, I think she thought that would be a better bet for me. She, she had ideas about Catholicism. Um, and I actually grew up with a female reverend, so I never found the leadership of women in spirituality to be an odd thing. So, you know, when I hear that, I find that strange because I, I grew up with that that image of a woman leading our, our church, you know. Um, but when my family isn't very religious. They just sort of sent us to church to, so we'd have something to do. <laughs> and it made them feel like good people. But I don't think um, I don't mean to speak ill of anyone. But, uh, you know, 
there wasn't a depth to it. It wasn't really about the religion or the spirituality. Actually, I was, my family was very, um, very uh, secular in the approach, you know, uh, with the exception of my mother's, my father's mother, who was very prolific with her rosary beads, very Irish, very Catholic. And I really liked that. I really gravitated towards that. She liked to tell tragic stories and had her rosary beads. It was all very, very dramatic. And like, uh, what would you say? Like, your what are your like beliefs? I guess about uh, God or the supernatural. What are my beliefs? Well, I try to believe nothing. I try to just suspend belief, and and you know, and this is a philosophy in itself, I suppose. But I try to continuously have direct experience with the divinity that I guess I could say that this is a belief that I believe lives in in all things um i i have a shamanistic view that the the whole world is animated or anima meaning soul right so the whole world is and in quantum physics might back this up and the fact that you know we used to think tables were solid now we know they're not that they're they're constantly moving that are molecules and um you know i have a very limited understanding of it but everything's constantly moving and in flux and, and alive basically so um I try to get my data downloads on, you know, co uh, constantly, and uh, and you know, let myself be free to to um, uh, respond as as I will. So, like, uh, how how does your work with like astrology work exactly? I guess like like the process of how does it work? Yeah, like uh, mm -hmm. how you predict things, I guess, or and all that. I try not to predict. I try to work with the universe. So, um, because prediction, I, I don't find to be helpful because we're co-creating moment to moment, right? So, I think of it as a um, we are the microcosm of the macrocosm. We're the small version of the entire universe. We're sort of downscaled, right? So, I think of the stars as a way to um, like a map. Think of it like a map. And I can't predict where anyone's going to go on this map, but I can tell you if you continue north, this is what's probably going to go on. You're probably going to hit this forest, and you're probably going to get to the ocean at that point if you go east far enough. And, you know, so this is sort of what I'm telling you. So it's more people. of like a reflection of the present than a reflection, like, of the future that you can see with... Uh... Yeah, you can, I mean, all time is now, in my opinion. All time is now. So there is no future, there is no past, where it is only now. I mean, can you, how would you, how, how can you tell me there's ever been a past? How do you know that? Nobody does. You have images in your mind that you call the past. But you don't really know that was the past. All you know is you're sitting in this chair right now. You know, you just believe it's the past, and you, that's your version of the past, and that's your your idea of it from your perspective, but we don't really know that it even happened, you know? That's what courts are set up to do, to sort of prove that it happened, but nobody really can, so it's just all subjective, right? And the future, nobody knows what that is. People say they do, and I, God bless them, but I don't know that, that anyone can, because it's always in flux. And like, uh, so like, what do you, with most of your work, like, what would you say, like, what kind of things uh, do you do readings on, mostly, I guess? Um, most people want to know about themselves. They want to know about work. They want to know about money. They want to know about sex. They want to know about love, and they want to know about relationships. And so that's the hook that they come in with. And then I usually steer them towards spiritual development, is what ends up happening. So, um... They ask me about their relationship, and then we usually get into a conversation about them and their deeper, what they're really looking for, and their shadow. And then we get into childhood. We get into all sorts of things. And, like, uh, how did you learn, like, uh, I guess, like, this kind of, uh, to do these kinds of readings with uh, astrology and everything? Well, um, I started learning astrology because I had a very strong sexual attraction to a uh, Scorpio uh, man, and um, I wanted to know more about him, and I wanted some infi inside information because I myself am, am a kind of scorpionic human being, you know, Plutonian. I've Pluto tattooed here on my 
on my over my heart. And so um, Pluto people, Plutonians, Scorpios are usually pretty investigative. So I wanted some backgrounds and I had a way to do this through astrology. So I started to learn that way. And then it just bloomed and developed. It was actually quite easy for me. I suspect that I've had a past life with astrology because it was really just simple for me. And people spend, you know, forever learning it and having a hard time with it. And I learned it quick. And that's not the case with all subjects I try to tackle for sure. So do you think it's some kind of, uh, do you think like there's a divine element with it? Like how the stars, uh, I guess, show people, I guess people's state of minds or where they are in, in life at that time or whatever. That's a good question. Is there a divine, like a divine plan? Yeah. I think the universe is constantly expanding. And I think it's, it's after its own observation of its own expansion. I think it wants to know more and more about itself all the time. And that's what causes us to have desire. Uh, I think it's one of these things that in mo many uh, spiritual and uh, religious religions, particularly patriarchal ones, we have a, a problem with desire as though that that's somehow anti-spiritual, but um, it causes suffering. That may be so, but suffering may be part of what we're d doing here, you know, to experience contrast and the ups, the downs. Why else be on earth if you're going to meditate and sort of hang out on a cloud, you know, why are you incarnate? Um, I don't know what the answers are to those questions. I'm just throwing, throwing them out, out there and being a wise guy a little bit. But, like, you know, the I think uh, astrology sort of gives us a sense of what that, what our personal part is in that expansion. Like, what perspective we're going to hold, the individual perspective that we are going to hold that separates itself or had the illusion of being separate from source perspective which encompasses everything the universe has ever experienced. That's the collective unconscious. We all have access to that, too. We have the illusion that we don't. That's Maya. And we we get a plan. We get, like, a blueprint, and this is the illusion that you're going to be under, and this is what you're going to do this time, and this is what you're going to experience. And by experiencing this, you're going to give yourself, as the universe, information about itself. If that... <laughs> You know, and this thing just keeps expanding. I mean, we kind of know that through science, too. The universe really, you know, is expanding, or at least we believe that. Who really knows? We've believed a lot of things. <laughs> so it's like, uh, I guess you're saying like all human behavior, all human experience, I guess, is connected on some level. Uh, I think so. I think we're all a fractal of source consciousness. We're all a fra you know, a piece of it. Yet where we are the whole thing in its totality at the same time, each of us is the whole thing in its totality um, simultaneously. That's sort of the paradox. And so, uh, but we have the perception of the world that we only come from a certain perspective. And we sign up for this. We're supposed to feel separated, and we're supposed to feel like we're the only ones who look at the world like this, and um, so that we have the experience for whatever reason. I don't know why. Sometimes I wonder. I look at my chart and I think, for God's sake, April, why did you sign up for this? <laughs> what planet were you on? <laughs> Speaking of planets, <laughs> oh, you thought you'd be a priestess. Oh, super. <laughs> Smart idea. <laughs> That'll get you big money. <laughs> oh boy. And uh so like what what can you say about um like uh the zodiac signs I guess and how would you say like I know you were saying yours your personality you think reflects like with like a, a Scorpio like reflects your sign and like how different, um, you know, they say people with certain signs are compatible with people with, uh, you know, a certain sign and all that. Do you think that's accurate? Like, uh, from your experience, I guess, like the people kind of fit uh, the like their sign, the description of their sign, I guess. Or? Well, I mean, the chart is hugely complicated. So there, this is why I, I, I charge what I charge for reading because. 
it's so much more than the sun sign. There's so many things that are involved in, in a chart. And so, yeah, you can say Gemini and, and Aries get along pretty well, or Sag and Aries are going to get along super well. And, but that's kind of bullshit surface astrology. You know, there that uh, there's a whole, it's called synastry. In astrology, there's a whole science and art to taking two charts and placing them next to each other and comparing them in the whole complexity of both charts. How this one's Venus matches up with the other one's Mars and how that one's Mars matches up with the other one's Sun. And that's that you know, Pluto's also involved. What does that mean when the three of them are there? And what does that mean when they're in this house? And that the cluster of houses over there, I mean, this gets into it. So, you know, people expect that I'm going to charge, you know, 40 bucks for a reading. And I say, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I do not think so. Because <laughs> this is going to take me all day to really look at this and then interpret it in English. What I'm seeing, I'm basically a language translator on top of being a, a, an artist and a scientist in this way, you know, and a, and a medium. So it's it's a lot of things, a lot of hats that are worn just in, in you know, working with, with this um, with this. Uh, this this uh, format. So how would you say like uh, the astrology uh, you study like differs one from I guess what most people think astrology is? Or what, like in what because you were saying it's like more complex and everything. Yeah, well, I think that most astrologers worth their salt are aware of that and work with that. So um, I know many very very wonderful astrologers. In fact, most astrologers do go into it that deeply but we all have a different interpretation of what we're seeing we're all bringing different viewpoints and gifts and and ideas about it so i you know my work i tend to go into um creativity a lot i go into shadow i go into a lot of jungian and archetypal stuff um i go into i i have a, a good uh, sense of how to pinpoint where somebody's really having a struggle and and take that apart and say this is really what's going on here you know, you're saying you want such and such, but you're doing this. So let's bring these two things together, you know. And also um, my the emphasis in my readings is on empowerment, self-empowerment, and on one's own magic and true will. That we don't just give over, you know, our, our responsibility and our authority to spirit. Spirit's not living our lives. We are. So we are a spirit. That's sort of how I, how I look at it. And what was, what was uh, and I know you taught uh, astrology too at Godard College. Goddard College, yeah. Yeah, and so what was what was it like uh, teaching this to other people? Well, oh. I, I teach ongoingly, um, I, I if that's a word. <laughs> I have classes on my website that people can download or that actually you sign up and I send you stuff because if there were so many things to download, I just actually send it, the earls to it. And um, uh, I teach pretty regularly. I do a lot of private lessons via Skype, and, and so it's a lot of fun for me to teach because I keep learning about astrology via teaching because I have to explain things, and when I have to explain them, I get even a more in-depth understanding of things. You know, even if it's beginning astrology, the more I go over it, the more I learn. So, like, what's your, I guess, what's your goal with, like, uh, your channel and everything and the readings you do on there, I guess? So, like, the new e reports? Yeah. Um, well, my goal is to make myself visible so people can actually connect with me and see me. I try to sum up what's currently going on in the stars um, and give it meaning, give it put it in English and give it meaning and let that that information come through me. So, for instance, I've been asked why I don't record them well in advance. I, I record them that day and put them out that day without delay. I try to you know, upload them the moment that I've, I'm finished speaking, I start uploading it. And the reason I do that is because whatever's coming out of my mouth is, that is the currency that's going on. You know, I'm kind of like a lightning rod or a, or a, a conduit, you know, so whatever, I don't even know what I'm going to say. I just set up the phone like I have it here with you and I, I set it up and I just start talking and, and I know when I'm finished and then I say, okay, we're done. So it's something that I like to do also. I enjoy relaying this information to people because why know it if I'm not going to share it? It's kind of like, you know, why do that? Why keep it? Keep it. Just for my own benefit. That's boring. 
And like, uh, so what can you say like about some of your other passions and how they, like, I guess, do they, how they tie in with uh, like your main work is with astrology and everything? Um, so I, I'm a dancer. I, I uh, do photography also. It's part of what I was doing today. I am a poet. I'm a musician also. I'm not the greatest you know, technician in the world, but I, I enjoy playing music. I'm a better composer. And uh, I, um, those are kind of the mediums I, I use. And I think of astrology as an art also. Um, and I think of myself kind of as a shamanic type artist. Uh, so I, I am, um, and I'm also very interested in surrealism and, um, I love the occult connections with the surrealism, the dreams, uh, the symbolism. I love sim the symbolist movements also very, uh, very, uh, important to me, but, um, the surrealist uh, ideas and I, I, and I'm also very interested in a lot of the early experimental films that were going on in the 1920s and, and, uh, th throughout the, the tw early 20th century and the way that people were using, realized to, to, how to use film and images to try to, um, uh, recreate their own dreams and sort of give the viewer this impression of being in the dream. Uh, the ideas around chance and randomness and synchronicity, Jung's ideas of synchronicity, and this is sort of what I'm, I'm re-exploring now. And uh, poetry is like that too. I'll just sort of look around, find a word, or I'll hear a word in a conversation somebody's having on the street, take that word and just blow it up into a poem, or somebody's painting. I've worked with other people's paintings before. Um, and right now I'm working with poems and, and, uh, and my own self-portrait. And trying to develop, you know, developing a body of work with that. Uh, but the dance fall, you know, I, I, I have a master's degree in interdisciplinary art. So the philosophy with that degree was that it doesn't really matter which medium you focus on. I mean, it matters. You develop that medium, but you're always developing yourself as an artist. To just get caught up in, in being just that kind of artist is very limiting. And that really worked for me because I'm not a specialist per se. I'm, I'm a, you know, jerk of all trades, mistress of none, right? You know, I think of it that way. I'm trying to get, you know, I'm, I'm good at things. And I have a lot of Gemini in my chart, so I'm actually very good at a lot of things. It's best for me to take a lot of skills and put them together as a composite. I do best with that rather than try to hone my skills at one particular thing, you know? So I sort of work like I get, I bring a lot of my skills together and then do, I do develop a focus and then I get very obsessed with the particular idea that I'm currently on, but yet the media that I'm using is multiple. And uh, so like with uh, your poetry and your music, like uh, what are the kind of things you talk about, I guess, in your lyrics and in your... Uh, a lot about time and the multiplicity of time and, and the, the, the time perception. I, I talk a lot about sex, um, death. And what else do you want to talk about? Time, sex, death. <laughs> there you go. I mean, <laughs> you get a, get time out of there. Sex and death. You're you're fine. You're you're covered pretty much. You know. So you're gonna have an audience. But uh, poetry is a hard sell. I find. I you know it's easy for me to get out there in a bikini with a skirt and dance and get people to be interested in that. But trying to get people to actually spend time reading the words that I've put on the page. It's a little bit trickier. We're not in that kind of an era right now, but I love it so much and I appreciate it so much. And I spent hours just arranging those words. I'll write the poem in two seconds, but I'll spend hours arranging those words like a painting. I choose every word very carefully, exactly where I put it. Um, and there, other poets appreciate that. <laughs> and that's about it. <laughs> So I'm trying to bring more appreciation to that by mixing that together with self-portraiture and then perhaps developing even a performance event where I would be dancing and using self-portraiture and using poems as all layers of, of content for this, you know, form. And like, uh, so what, like, uh, what's been your experience with like, uh, poetry festivals, I guess, or anything? 
Oh, I love them so much because I'm around other poets and other poets will spend the time to really listen and really read what my words say and spend the time bringing that into their own imaginations and into their own bodies. And they come out with things that I wasn't thinking, but boy, I'm so glad to know what this effect is. And I'm listening and paying attention to poetry and getting uh, exposed to more things. There's a Massachusetts Poetry Festival that happens every uh, May here in Salem, and I rather enjoy that. Um, it's also appealing to me, these festivals, because something like dance, you'll find most people are under 40, you know, at clubs, uh, some dance events, depending on the kind of event, but it's very much geared toward the way people look and their fitness of their bodies and that kind of thing. Whereas something like poetry and writing, you'll find people of all ages and many different kinds of experiences and their experiences and their perspectives are made into art and also um, cared about. And that's something that I find very precious and enjoy a lot. So like, how did you first learn uh, like how to play music and uh, how to like write poetry and all that? And like, how did, when did you first, uh, when did you first get started with it? Well, poems I started writing as a teenager. I had a journal. I was very, you know, very goth and, and I was a metalhead and I was very anti and very, you know, hoodlum and everybody was, you know, I had a God is Dead t-shirt, you know, the like Nietzsche. <laughs> that I wore like every day. <laughs> and a leather jacket and I wrote, had a journal and I would just sort of sit and write about how nobody understood me, you know. <laughs> like, you know, scowling with my, had a big piece of hair that was always over one eye and it was all like black raccoon eyeliner, you know, and, <laughs> um, and, and so I, w I would just, I started writing poetry then. I can't say it was very good, but I look back at the things that I wrote. I have a few things still, and it definitely helped me get through a lot of really difficult years there with, with uh, my, you know, my teen years. And then, um, you know, and I've just picked it up and dropped it off and on. Um, and then uh, music, I start, I didn't start that uh, until later, until my mid-20s, because uh, no one was was musical in my household, but yet I found out later that my father is a musician, um, singer, and a dancer, and had a pretty tragic incident with a with uh, the band that he was in. He had given up a football scholarship to, to play music, and something happened that caused that to, to screech to a halt. And uh, but my grandparents also were dancers, and her, my grandmother's brothers learned how to play piano on their own. They're both self-taught. Well, I'm a self-taught pianist and a singer. And I didn't know that any of this was true for that side of the family. And I did this on my own. And then I mentioned to my dad, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was in a, he's Bronx guy. He's like, I was in a band. And I was like, really, dad? That's nice you told me that. My older sister, who's 12 years older than me, says that my father had a beautiful, has a beautiful voice, you know, and I had never heard him sing. I never heard him sing. So they just stopped at one point. So there was some pain around that, I think, that caused the stoppage to occur. Mm -hmm. So I just sort of picked it up on my own and then found this out later. And uh, how would you, like, what was it like first learning to compose music and how do you feel you've improved over the years, I guess, as a musician? I think my work ethic has improved as a musician because I've, uh, because of my, um, uh, touring with dance and, and uh, um, the pressure that was on me to continue to perform a lot with dance, you know, music it, it never was that. I, 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 but dance was that way. And uh, again, that interdisciplinary art philosophy I've seen play out, you know, um, so that the better I got as a dancer, when I, even if I drop music for a year or more, I'll go back to playing piano and I, my sense of it, uh, is much sharper. I want to practice more often and I want to, you know, whereas maybe prior to that I would be satisfied with what I would now call half-assed, you know, I would, I'll, I'll push it a lot harder and sit there a lot longer to learn. Uh, so the, the more I develop as a dancer, the more I 
feel my 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 ideals, my standards heighten in the other uh, media that I work with. And uh, how would you describe uh, the process of writing a song, and how long does it usually take? I usually write a song all of a sudden. You know, I just will sit and I'll find chords and I'll do it and I'll write it and I just get the notebook and it's done. Now refining it, remembering it, you know, all that and making, you know, getting the lyrics to, to be, you know, in cadence and everything else. That's more a left brain process. But that right brain thing, I'll usually have something that's bothering me or, you know, something that is causing me pain. And then I sit down and I write about it and that's that happens very quickly. But I don't think the actual entire process is quick. I think it's just invisible or unconscious. And then it seems to happen very fast. But I think it actually is, is brewing for a while. So is it is it hard to uh, like find time uh, for all of your passions rather than uh, focus just on one, I guess? Or? Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I have a lot of Gemini, you know, and I want to do everything all the time and I exhaust myself. So sometimes I do nothing because I'm just so overwhelmed. Like I just can't do anything. And I just want to sit and, you know, sit in my garden or hang out with my dog. And, and I think those are actually healthy times because those are the times where things gestate. So you, you do need that anyway. Uh, but I also... Um, <laughs> run myself silly like today you know where I was I couldn't get here on time and all that kind of stuff you know I want to see it all happen uh and you know my astrology now is is a full-time job I mean it's a it's a five day a week full-time job I get up at seven every day and make my dog his breakfast you know like I said I cook for him and I make my coffee and have my breakfast and I meditate and do my morning practices a little yoga and I get right into writing my blog, and then it's readings, you know. Uh, actually, I do administrative stuff. First thing, I do emails, and then I do readings the rest of the day. And then I tackle my art in the evening and try to have a social life, which that's usually what goes on the back burner because I'm a little bit of a, a recluse sometimes, you know. I, I'm either on or I'm off. And uh, have you ever thought about, like, tying any of it together like maybe do a show with like music and poetry and I guess dancing too like yeah that's that's my next step is I kind of want to make my magnum opus you know with all of this and and uh bring it all together in some way uh and that's that's the challenge for me is that kind of discipline and focus on form and making things manifest in that way uh is 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 a challenge for me and it's one that i welcome and uh so what can you say about uh belly dancing and how you got started with it that also came later i really didn't dance as a kid or a teenager i thought i was too tall too awkward too angular too not so attractive i didn't really think of myself that way um i thought i was just you know kind of a i, I I don't know. I just didn't really have very high self regard and didn't think that I was womanly enough to really do something like that. And then I started taking some classes with a teacher named Alia, who's still my friend. And um, she's actually flattered me and honored me by coming to some of my classes, which I was totally intimidated by this fact. I'm like, no, Alia, you can't be in my class. This is going to be too crazy. I can't do this because, you know, but she's amazing, and um, and uh, so I saw her dance, and I had seen, I think, other dancers. I can't remember. I just remember the impression that it had was that I saw a woman totally erotic but totally self-possessed, and I had never been struck that way before. Usually if I'd seen women displaying themselves in any erotic way, that was cheap or that was degrading. That was what I was raised with. That's the idea around that. And that's, that's our cultural milieu, right? That, that women who do that are, have problems and don't value their own intelligence and blah, 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 which, you know, I've come to understand is bullshit. But, you know, this is, this is what, you know, there's, there's, there's women who do that and there's women who respect themselves and they're not the same. You know, and then and then uh, um, 
I saw belly dancers who were, you know, real belly dancers, not somebody wiggling on a show, but like, you know, somebody really doing this and owning the crowd. You know, this was erotic, but the women who were doing this didn't have to be 20 years old. So there wasn't this patriarchal gaze on this that was determining that you had to be skinny and young and white and like anything else. This was like women who were all different ages, who were all, you know, uh, different kinds of bodies and were very confident. And there was a spiritual aspect to it that I couldn't put my finger on, like what that was. And I now understand that, at least it's said, that these dances come from goddess temples. That's where they, they're coming from. And this was, this is actually a, the coins are from these sacred temples where women would initiate uh, uh, people into the goddess through sexuality. And we've sort of, it's sort of been diluted and, you know, it's brought, been brought through the timeline. But this is what we get now. We have, this is our sort of remnants of that. And so this is the holiness that I was sensing when I'm watching this. And I now understand that, and now I bring that in consciously to the work that I do. You know, this holy sexuality is very conscious for me. That this, you can't, you are absolutely self-possessed when you dance, or you can be. You know, and your sexuality can be running through you, and your spiritual at the same time. And you're an artist, and you're a feminist, and none of these things are mutually mutually exclusive in any fucking way. You know, so. And, and has, uh, like, uh, there been any backlash, I guess, from your family? You said they were more conservative about this and other things. Uh, when you started diving more into this and, I guess, some of the other stuff? Or... My dad loves it. He thinks it's awesome. He thinks I look like a little too much like a vampire. That's the big problem that he really has. <laughs> he keeps him saying I'm too pale. This is the problem, really, with it, that it's not the dancing, which I thought he'd have a heart attack, you know, about that. It's not that. He doesn't see everything, you know. My dad, he's not on the Internet, you know, so he doesn't see everything. He can, but, you know, it's all out there. But, you know, I don't show him a lot of my photography, certainly. He doesn't read my poems. He's not terribly interested in that. He doesn't have any patience for anything but cutting coupons these days. And, like, you know, he's, he's who he is, you know. But I look like a vampire. He doesn't understand this. Why do why you want to look like you're the living dead? He doesn't understand that scenario. So he thinks I need to wear, you know, a better foundation. That's the concern he has. I need a little blusher, is what he says. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the reaction there. My grandparents were very pleased to hear that I travel all over the world and dance. They, they love this fact, because I think that they would have liked to have done that, you know. Um, that I go to Europe and, and, and perform and teach and that I get paid to do this is, is pretty amazing for them. They, they, they've, they liked that. And, uh, so like, uh, is there different styles of belly dancing? Like how do they differ from each other? It's a lot of different styles of belly dance. Um, and there's, there's, it would be too much to probably go into in this interview, but what I was raised on is called American cabaret. So it's sort of a mixture of, traditional Middle Eastern dance and Hollywood influences and nightclub from, from influences from Egypt and uh, Turkey. And they have all kind of come together to converge into this dance that, you know, some belly dance snobs will, will say that this is traditional and, and anything else beyond this that's developed is, is not. And that's actually not true. It was very, very Hollywood influenced, actually. The whole bedla, the, the bra and the skirt thing with all the sparkles, that's not Middle Eastern. <laughs> That's straight out of 1930s Hollywood, you know, um, and Orientalism, the fantasy of what belly dance is. Actually, uh, a lot of Middle Eastern dancers in the Middle East, you don't dance for uh, the opposite sex, and you wear something that covers your entire body. It's pretty loose, and you have a, a, a scarf around your, your hips. So this idea of a sexy, buxom belly dancer is, is actually a Western fantasy that has been adopted by dancers in the Middle East and then turned into what it's been so it's like this this thing and then there's um tribal tribal has come out of california so there's a lot of educated white women that sort of put in a, together a middle easterny thing along with flamenco and you know a couple of other things and called it tribal and working groups with women and just their own orientalist fantasy and then tribal fusions coming out of that which involves hip-hop and breakdance and 
that's a solo thing. So, and I'm, I'm very influenced by that as well. And Gothic. And I mean, there's a million, there's lots of different ways to, to come at this, but, uh, in the United States, the two main ones are American cabaret and tribal. And, uh, what was, uh, your experience like teaching it? I enjoy it very much. I, I like the travel that I do. I love who I meet. I, I try to use belly dance as an undercover way to actually teach spirituality and teach self-development and growth. So people think they're going to come and learn how to look like this. And I have them come out, you know, <laughs> really having investigated who they are and why they want to look like that and what they would want really for their lives and how dance can inform and, and uh, express and, and contribute to that. And uh, I know, what can you say about uh, the fitness teaching you do? Does that tie in with, like, spirituality and everything else? Or? Fitness, yeah, I think so. I think it's very hard to, to really be engaged with oneself and not have a physical fitness element into one's life. Like, if you're not connected to your body, you're kind of not connected because our bodies are the... Uh, they they tell us how we're feeling. They tell us what our they never lie. If you have a lower backache, it's a message you're not being supported in life. You don't have enough support. You have a neck ache, you're getting too you're up in your head too much and you need to come down into your body, you know? I mean it can be that literal. Your stomach is having butterflies or you feel oogie when somebody says something, you've got a boundary being crossed. And the more you're able to be in connecting to that the, the better off you are. So fitness, you know, you, you, the body is, is the vehicle for being in the physical world. So if you have a weak body, it's very hard to do that well. Now, some people are ill and some people have, uh, have had accidents and have been injured and, and that's part of the path that they're on. But you, you, we should all, you know, regardless, try to be, I think, this is, you know, my own, this is a belief right here, you know, try to be in, in our, the best that we can be with that. Try to be as healthy as we can. And sicknesses are also messengers. <laughs> and uh, so I guess anything, final things you want to say about your channel or the work you do or anything that maybe we didn't cover? Oh, that's a good question. Only that I enjoy it so much and that I just feel, uh, you know, I feel honored that, I have so much support with this particular, both the arts and, and the astrology, that, that people do tune into my videos, you know, every week, and they wait for them. People, if I don't put them up, I get questions, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm all right. I'm just fucking off, actually, but, yeah, I'll put one up today, you know. <laughs> or, uh, you know, um I posted something a couple of days ago that was a little bit raw and I got a very powerful response from lots of people and messages and all that. And uh, I thought that that was very wonderful and very beautiful. Um, and uh, so I feel very lucky and I also have worked very hard to be that, you know, to, to not work for a company, not work nine to five to make sure I have my own, you know, I'm captain of my own ship so that I can be authentic. When I tell people you need to do this yourself, you need to find your, follow your bliss. You know, when I say that to people, I, it's because I've, I'm doing it. I'm trying to do it. You know, I don't always follow my bliss. I often follow my fear. I often follow, you know, what's bothering me. I often worry about things that I wish I didn't, but I, I really do endeavor to, um, be authentic and follow my bliss. And, uh, I guess if you want to plug your website and tell people where they can find you on social media and all that. Yeah, I, aprilsastrology.com is my astrology. aprilshaley.com is my belly dance and multimedia sort of multi stuff site, which is, you know, packed like a sardine can. It, it really needs a revamp, which will be happening soon. And, um, also, an event that I run, uh, well, now we're, we're going to do it bi-yearly. It's called Occult, and it's a um, the juxtaposition of art and magic. So we, we bring together the arts 
and magic and, and those, those philosophies and we bring teachers and stuff like that. So that's occultartsalem.net. All right. Well, uh, I think that does it for this episode of uh, BSing with Sean K. Uh, BSing with Sean K. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And, uh, thanks again to April for uh, coming on oh, and uh, BSing. Yep. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, this was a uh, this was a good one, I think. So, uh, yeah, and I should have I should have more episodes coming soon. So uh, stay tuned. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.